Members of the council, thank you very much for allowing me to be here today. My name is Paul Powell. I live at 13061 North Andy's Gulch Road in Hidden Springs. Uh, I'm representing the Idaho Petroleum Council, I'm the vice president of that association, industry association, which uh, is made up of leaders in the oil and gas exploration, production, uh, transportation uh, industry. <coughs> and our main goal is. One goal is to make sure that we have, uh, or to encourage consistent, uh, you know, regulatory framework across uh, producing states, uh, so we don't have a hodgepodge of different regulations as much as possible. And the other major focus we have is to uh, be a resource for elected official, officials, policymakers, uh, and the public as we deal as this new industry, this infant, is in its infant stages here in Idaho, uh, moves forward. Uh, and myself, I'm president of Petroglyph Energy, which is a Boise headquartered oil and gas exploration and production company. We have uh, uh, wells primarily in the state of Utah, about 600 wells in Utah and some in North Dakota. Uh, and uh, we have to operate there in the UNF Basin in northeastern Utah that's been producing oil and natural gas since 1948, uh, commercially feeding uh, five refineries in the Salt Lake City area. Uh, I would point out that we, Petroglyph Energy do not have any leases, wells, or field operations in the state of Idaho. Uh, we just happen to live here. Our parent company uh, owned Intermountain Gas for about 30 years. So uh, we love Idaho and uh, right next door to Eagle here. If you can if you indulge me, sometimes a picture's worth a thousand words. I have like a five minute video on how an oil well is drilled and completed and fracked. And I think uh, that will give us a basis for uh, discussions going forward, if I may. Geologists have known for years that substantial deposits of oil and natural gas were trapped in deep shale formations. These shale reservoirs were created tens of millions of years ago. Around the world today, with modern horizontal drilling techniques and hydraulic fracturing, the trapped oil and natural gas in these shale reservoirs is being safely and efficiently produced, gathered, and distributed to customers. Let's look at the drilling and completion process of a typical oil and natural gas well. Shale reservoirs are usually one mile or more below the surface, well below any underground source of drinking water, which is typically no more than 300 to 1,000 feet below the surface. Additionally, steel pipes, called casing, cemented in place, provide a multi-layered barrier to protect freshwater aquifers. During the past 60 years, the oil and gas industry has conducted fracture stimulations in over 1 million wells worldwide. The initial steps are the same as for any conventional well. A hole is drilled straight down using freshwater-based fluids, which cools the drill bit, carries the rock cuttings back to the surface, and stabilizes the wall of the well bore. Once the hole extends below the deepest freshwater aquifer, the drill pipe is removed and replaced with steel pipe, called surface casing. Next, cement is pumped down the casing. When it reaches the bottom, it is pumped down and then back up between the casing and the borehole wall, creating an impermeable additional protective barrier between the well bore and any freshwater sources. In some cases, depending on the geology of the area and the depth of the well, additional casing sections may be run and, like surface casing, are then cemented in place to ensure no movement of fluids or gas between those layers and the groundwater sources. What makes drilling for hydrocarbons in a shale formation unique is the necessity to drill horizontally. Vertical drilling continues to a depth called the kickoff point. This is where the well bore begins curving to become horizontal. One of the advantages of horizontal drilling is that it's possible to drill several wells from only one drilling pad, minimizing the impact to the surface environment. When the targeted distance is reached, the drill pipe is removed, and additional steel casing is inserted through the full length of the well bore. Once again, the casing is cemented in place. For some horizontal developments, new technology in the form of sliding sleeves and mechanical isolation devices replace cement in the creation of isolations along the well bore. Once the drilling is finished and the final casing has been installed, the drilling rig is removed and preparations are made for the next steps, well completion. 
first step in completing the lab is the creation of a connection between the final casing and the reservoir rock. This consists of lowering a specialized tool called a perforating gun, which is equipped with shaped explosive charges, down to the rock layer containing oil or natural gas. This perforating gun is then fired, which creates holes through the casing, cement, and into the target rock. These perforating holes connect the reservoir and the wall bore. Since these perforations are only a few inches long and are performed more than a mile underground, the entire process is imperceptible on the surface. The perforation gun is then removed in preparation for the next step, hydraulic fracturing. The process consists of pumping a mixture of mostly water and sand, plus a few chemicals, under controlled conditions into deep underground reservoir formations. The chemicals are generally for lubrication, to keep bacteria from forming, and help carry the sand. These chemicals typically range in concentrations from 0.1 to 0.5% by volume, and help to improve the performance of the stimulation. This stimulation fluid is sent to trucks that pump the fluid into the well bore and out through the perforations that were noted earlier. This process creates fractures in the oil and gas reservoir rock. The sand in the frac fluid remains in these fractures in the rock and keeps them open when the pump pressure is relieved. This allows the previously trapped oil or natural gas to flow to the well bore more easily. This initial stimulation segment is then isolated with a specially designed plug and the perforating guns are used to perforate the next stage. This stage is then hydraulically fractured in the same manner. This process is repeated along the entire horizontal section of the well, which can extend several miles. Once the stimulation is complete, the isolation plugs are drilled out and production begins. Initially water, and then natural gas or oil, flows into the horizontal casing and up the well bore. In the course of initial production of the well, approximately 15 to 50% of the fracturing fluid is recovered. This fluid is either recycled to be used on other fracturing operations, or safely disposed of according to government regulations. The whole process of developing a well typically takes from three to five months, a few weeks to prepare the site, four to six weeks to drill the well, and then one to three months of completion activities, which includes one to seven days of stimulation. But this three to five month investment can result in a well that will produce oil or natural gas for 20 to 40 years or more. When all of the oil or natural gas that can be recovered economically from a reservoir has been produced, work begins to return the land to the way it was before the drilling operations commenced. <laughs> pipes cut off three to six feet below ground level. All surface equipment will be removed, and all pads will be filled in with dirt or replanted. The land can then be used again by the landowner for other activities, and there will be virtually no visual signs that a well was once there. Today, hydraulic fracturing has become an increasingly important technique for producing oil and natural gas in places where the hydrocarbons were previously inaccessible. Technology will continue to be developed to improve the safe and economic development of oil and gas resources. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, thank you for indulgence on that video. Although uh, I recognize it's the only one I had, I recognize it's not exactly the kind of drilling that's being done out in Fayette County uh, as far as uh, them doing uh, vertical wells and, and uh, not fracking the well. But since that's the topic I was asked to speak to you about tonight, uh, fracking, I'll focus on that. Um, So what phase are we at in the life cycle of oil and gas in this industry in Idaho currently? Uh, as I think uh, the prior speaker mentioned, uh, there was an exploration phase that's gone on for about 100 years, from early 1900s to the early 2000s. There were about 150 uh, wells drilled in the state of Idaho, uh, none of which uh, were economic, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, and then more recently, we've had uh, the discoveries out in Payette County of uh, gas at about 5,000 feet in sandstone formations. And so we've kind of moved from 
the exploration phase of trying to find something, once you think you found something, uh, the next step is off called the land rush, but it's basically you, uh, before competition rolls in, you want to leave, get as, uh, your hands on as many mineral leases, as much land as possible. And, and the former speaker was correct that uh, you do look for the biggest blocks, whether it be from state, uh, federal, or large landowners, uh, to accumulate as much uh, as possible. Now what you don't know at this point, you know you think you found something, you don't know whether that land is going to end up being productive or not, uh, or what's uh, affectionately known as the industry as goat pasture. But you need to then move to the commercialization and actually uh, prove that you have commercial uh, sellable product. Uh, that's the phase I understand to my, that I understand Ultimates is in at this point. Uh, and, but once you've got that pilot area and you've commercialized it, now you got to start the geologic assessment to see how how big is this resource and what you have and what might be uh, effective for lands uh, and before you then kind of work your way out and expand and develop. But I think that's uh, one very key point since this development is currently uh, centered out uh, in Payette County. Uh, you know, there's times we'll kind of watch that grow, see how that unfolds. Uh, it, it's uh, quite a ways from here in Eagle, and you don't just hopscotch around the country because with the gas field, you got to lay uh, you know, pipe and transmission lines to get it to, to market. So uh, there's a, a period of growth, expansion, of developing the resource, developing the infrastructure, uh, and then eventually competition rolls in, industry matures, and, and grows. And so uh, it's, it's important to know where we are in that process. Now, when you ask the question, how is this going to be developed, how, how do you go about deciding how to do it, in my opinion, you know, it's, it's all in the rocks because uh, the hydrocarbons are in sedimentary rock, typically laid down in a marine environment, and it's either, often either sandstones or shales, so there's quite a difference. I mean, this is an example of sandstones that we're producing oil from over in Utah, and it's very important to note that the oil is not in a pool underground, it's in the pores of the rock. And the oil or gas flows through the pores of those rocks, and that's it's called permeability. So if the pores are connected and the oil or gas can flow through, you have permeability, and it may be enhanced further if there's some natural fracturing in the rock. But uh, it's, it's uh, the, the type of development folks will do here in Idaho is based on what the rocks tell them. And if you have high permeability, uh, uh, you don't need to frack. If you don't have high permeability, good flow through the path, uh, then you would then you would normally frack. But we're in Utah, uh, we drill about 60 wells a year, uh, frack every one of them, and that's, uh, I don't know if one in the Uinta Basin that uh, has been drilled not, and not completed with hydraulic fracturing. But, when you have that, the result of that porosity and the ability to drain the gas or oil through the rock, you end up with what's called drainage area. And that's where you get to well spacing, whether you can, uh, a gas well can drain 640 acres or not. Um, you know, often with oil wells, it's quite typically 40 acres is a standard state spacing. Uh, and, but those rocks will dictate the drilling and completion techniques, whether it's most cost effective or efficient, drill a vertical well, drill a horizontal well, uh, hydraulically fracture it, don't hydraulically fracture it. It's, uh, uh, you know, that if you want to follow what the industry is going to do, you follow the rocks because that, that uh, tells you everything. And the part of the key is, it's ultimately about economics because industry is not going to do something just because it's possible they're going to do it if it makes sense and makes makes money. When we drill typical oil well over in Utah, cost a million dollars a piece, about 30% of that is a hydraulic fracture. So it's it's a significant decision and, and it's not an immaterial amount to your rate of return whether you need to employ more expensive techniques or not. And simply the decision of whether you drill a vertical well or a horizontal well uh, if you drill a vertical well in a week, it takes you a month to drill a horizontal well, your burn rate's about $40,000 a day. So it's a material difference uh, in, in uh, there are a lot of techniques available 
the issue, as I pointed out, is finding the technique that fits the resource that you're developing uh, here in Idaho. Obviously, from prior presentation and others, there's myriad questions that get raised when, particularly when the industry is new in a given area. Uh, there's obviously questions about hydraulic fracturing, and I've heard horizontal fracking, which frankly there's no difference in how technically you do a, a vertical uh, hydraulic fracturing job in a horizontal other than how you handle the gravity uh, when you're on well bores on site. Obviously, people, everyone's concerned with water quality, or uh, integration issues, split state issues. So there's a number of things to be educated on. There's always a point of view, and the key point is there are numerous states, and even next door in Utah where we operate, <coughs> been through all these, nothing new here. It's all been addressed, and there's, uh, you can just look, uh, look to the neighbors and see how it's being done, and, and it's been there and handled before. So it's. It's nothing new. Now, I'm talking about hydraulic fracturing specifically. You saw in the video, it's all about using uh, water pressure uh, to create the fracture, fill it with sand so the rock doesn't uh, press back together. And you're creating, instead of you think of the permeability of the rock, like the surface streets here, and maybe some natural fractures like Highway 44, what you're trying to do is create that uh, I-84 that connects those other uh, pathways to your well bore. The issue is how much of your rock is uh, connected to your well bore. Uh, brief history, well stimulation goes back to the 1860s. Uh, uh, I think it was uh, dropping nitroglycerin down well to kind of shake things up a bit. Uh, hydraulic fracturing was, uh, experimental use was in 1947. Commercial use began in 1949. Currently, there are 1.2 uh, million, more than 1.2 million wells that have been completed with hydraulic fracturing, and over 90% of the wells drilled today uh, are completed with hydraulic fracturing. So it's it's not new. It's, it's uh, being done every day, and it's interesting if you've been in the industry a while that fracking is a term that seems to be fairly new to the uh, public vocabulary, but like I say, it's, it's been around for decades. It's been uh, used for decades. <coughs> now, what is this fluid that gets pumped in the ground, what does it consist of? I gave you a handout there that's a little easier to read. Uh, but basically, 99.5% nine, water and sand. Uh, some of the chemicals that are included, uh, biocides, so you don't introduce bacteria into the formation, uh, thickening agents like chlor. <coughs> Uh, you know, which would be a thickening agent used in salad dressing and other uh, things. So you can see what is what are these different things used for? What are they? Is the purpose of fracking? But then also, what is the you know common household use for these different items? And the question was asked earlier: Do you report have some way of reporting what gets put in these wells? And that's true. Frackfocus.org is a website where industry uses to uh, post the Every, all the components that went into that uh, craft job. Uh, you can look, you know, search by state, by county, by specific well. Uh, every well we fractured, there's a, a one page with exactly what the percentage, what the compound was that is in that, that frack job. So it is, uh, you, you have to report it to the state. The state requires us in Utah to report it on frackfocus.org so that the general public can access the data. So is uh, hydraulic fracturing only used for oil and gas? Uh, it's actually used, uh, has been used in stimulating uh, some water wells, geothermal wells. But interestingly enough, it's uh, used by EPA as a, a tool, a remediation tool in their Superfund cleanup sites as well. So it's uh, not just an oil and gas uh, process. It, it has other useful uses. But ultimately, the issue is, is it safe? Is it, uh, or are there all these, you know, uh, problems that are just waiting to come down the road? And if you look at our top regulators and what they say about hydraulic fracturing, like EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy, there's nothing inherently dangerous in fracking that sound engineering practices can't accomplish. Or uh, Interior Secretary Sally Jewell, fracking's been done safely for decades. There's no doubt that this essential tool will be used for decades to come. Or Secretary Moniz, 
I still have not seen any evidence of fracking, per se, contaminated groundwater. And I would encourage you, as you go through in educating yourself through this whole process, uh, for every scary picture, there's a story. And, you know, as a simple example, one of the, you know, iconic uh, images from the movie Gasland was the guy lighting his, uh, you know, water, tap water's kitchen sink on fire. Well, there's a story behind every one of those. In that particular case in Well County, Colorado, uh, Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission investigated that. Uh, the insinuation it was due to fracking, uh, deep gas exploration in the area. Turns out, when you look at the drilling report from the guy's water well, drilled through four different uh, layers of coal, coal seams, and coal seams are full of methane, and the methane sure is in the water well, but it was uh, not there due to fracking or uh, deep gas exploration actually it was biogenic when they ran tests on the, the isotopic analysis of the gas you can tell the difference between biogenic gas and thermogenic gas thermogenic being buried deep underground in temperature and pressure the uh, organic matter is cooked into your oil or gas over time uh, biogenic is more like what the uh, Ada County landfill is collecting and burning off the landfill so there's a, a distinct fingerprint to the type again. So there's a the point being not to debunk every every myth in there, but every scary picture has a story, just like every dispute that comes before you here at the council chambers from time to time. And we just have to dig under the covers and understand the story and how has it been handled in states previously, and how is it why is it that all of these uh, key regulators in our country are saying this is a safe process, it's been done safely, and it will continue to be done safely for decades. So uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you.